The Buddha's basic teaching on insight is the Four Noble Truths. We tend to lose sight of that fact. Thinking that insight consists of seeing the inconstancy and stress and not-selfness of things. And it does, but it, that insight has to take place in a larger context, which is of the Four Noble Truths. which come down to cause and effect, skillful and unskillful. The things you do that lead to suffering and the things you can do that lead to the end of suffering. The doing there is important, because we shape our experience much more than we might imagine. And the insight lies in seeing precisely that fact, that what we're doing to shape things, even though we seem think sometimes that we're sitting here very perfectly still not doing anything at all. There's an undercurrent of sankhara, or fashioning, that goes on in the mind all the time. And insight shows its usefulness in pointing out the fact that we're doing the shaping and also showing us where we're doing it in unskillful ways so we can do it more skillfully. That's what the insights consist of, catching yourself creating trouble, basically. Catching yourself creating stress, creating unnecessary burdens for yourself. Seeing it as it actually happens, and realizing that it was a choice you made. I think it was a John Fuhrer who once time said that basic insight comes down to seeing your own stupidity. Something that you're doing, you don't have to do it, but you're creating suffering for yourself. Not only that, for the people around you. And you keep on doing it again and again and again. That's the definition of stupidity. We don't like to think of ourselves as being stupid, but we are. And it's when you finally develop the equanimity to admit that fact, step back from your stupidity and learn how to unlearn it, all those actions. That's what in insight is, and that's how it shows its benefits. And teaching you to fashion things in a new way, a better way, so that your participation in shaping your experience, your participation in the world all around you, gets more and more skillful. If it didn't show itself in these ways, then the insight wouldn't really be worth much. There are lots of teachings about emptiness and inconstancy or impermanence that are wide of the mark, and it's nice to know and it's interesting to reflect on these things and speculate about them. But if they don't make any difference in what you're actually doing from moment to moment, they're pretty useless. This is why the Buddha avoided so many issues that everybody else in his time was worked up about. Is the body the same as a life force? Is the body different from a life force? Is the world eternal? Is it not eternal? Is it finite? Is it infinite? When a person reaches the end of the path, does that person exist, not exist, both, neither? These are questions that were the hot issues, the hot philosophical issues of the day. And the Buddha refused to answer those questions, get involved in them at all, because they didn't make any difference in this one issue of what are you doing that's skillful and unskillful? And can you learn to be more skillful than you are? A lay person who was a student of the Buddhist was approached one time by someone who asked just these questions. What does your teacher teach? Does he teach that the world is finite or infinite? And the person said, well, no. Eternal, not eternal. Well, he doesn't address that issue either. And so on down the list. And the person complained, well, your teacher doesn't seem to teach anything at all. And the person said, no, that's not the case. He teaches what's skillful and what's unskillful. Remember that, the most basic issue that the Buddha does address, and he addresses that issue in a lot of detail. If meditating were simply an issue of trying to get very still in the present moment, how do you think all those Dharma teachings would have been developed? All those, what they call the 84,000 divisions of the Dharma in the canon. They came from someone who was 
really focused on the issue of skill and lack of skill and trying to develop more ways of skillful ways of approaching everything in life. This is how your daily practice intersects with your meditation practice. Just try to be more skillful in what you say, be more skillful in what you do. Develop that habit of being very clear about what your intentions are, clear about what your actions are, and about the results. And you develop that attitude, and then as you bring it into the meditation, you start seeing things in your meditation that you didn't see before. And at the same time, as you develop in your meditation, you get more sensitive to your actions outside as well. So in this way, the, your practice with your eyes closed and your practice out dealing with other people becomes more of a whole. Tackling the issue of skillfulness on all fronts. Try to make that the thread that connects everything you're doing as you practice. This is the thread that turns daily life into really a practice of daily life, the practice of daily life, where your intersection with other people, your interaction with other people does become part of your practice. The work you do becomes part of your practice. Everything you do and say and think can become part of your practice this way if you approach it from the issue of what's skillful here, what's not skillful here, what choices do I have? taking advantage of the freedom that every moment offers to make the best choice possible. When issues come up in daily life, try to approach them as this kind of challenge. When issues like lust or anger or fear arise in the mind, those are opportunities to approach these problems in a skillful way. All too often we, we're afraid of fear, we're angry about our anger lustful about our lust. In other words, we take our these unskillful mental states and we approach them in unskillful ways, which just compounds the problem. So the issue learns is in learning how to be how not to be lustful for your lust, how not to be angry about your anger. How not to be afraid of your fear. And that way you can deal with these issues a lot more skillfully. When anger arises. Many times we've heard, and it's constantly repeated, that the antidote for anger is metta, or goodwill. It's interesting, though, to look in the, in the canon to see what the Buddha says about anger. The closest he comes to that is when he talks about the sublime attitudes as antidotes to anger. In other words, it's not just metta. You want to develop the other qualities, too. And the one that he seems to develop most in different passages and in the canon is equanimity. Equanimity mean, meaning stepping back from the situation, seeing it as a universal pattern and not just a personal issue between you and the person you're angry about. One of the traditional ways of developing equanimity is to contemplate the principle of karma, that what you do is important, and particularly in the situation in which you find yourself. The issue is not so much what the other person is doing, but what you're doing. Focus on that. If you let yourself get worked up about what the other person is doing, how often they've done that, and how many times it's come back again and again and again, if you carry that around, it makes it more and more difficult for you to deal with what you're coming up with in the present moment. So drop that thinking about what the person has been doing, and turn around and look at what you're doing. It's useful to divide the anger into three parts. One is the, the object of the anger. Second is the anger itself as a mental state, and then there's the physical manifestations of anger. When you can separate them out this way, it becomes a lot easier to deal with. So to separate the anger itself from the object of anger, you step back and think in terms of equanimity. Another way the Buddha has is just, just looking at the universality of this project. The process. He talks about dividing reasons for being angry. He sets them out in a kind of a chart. One way of one reason for being angry, or one's chart, is that this person has done something to me that I don't like, 
or this person has done something that I don't, don't like to people that I love, or this person has done nice things to people I don't like. And in each case you're supposed to reflect, well, what should I expect? And this is the way of the world. That question, what should I expect, asked with that tone of voice, is meant to pull you back a little bit to start seeing the situation in a, in a larger context. Then you go on to, this person is doing something to me that I don't like. This person is doing something I don't like to people I like. This person is doing something likable for the people I don't like. In other words, you bring it into the present tense. And then again, it's, what should I expect? In the next three sets is putting into the future. This person is going to do something to me that I won't like. So on down the line. And it's when you stop and think about that, just that simple act of stepping back from the situation and putting into a framework like that can help give you some perspective. In other words, you reflect on the ways of the world. There are ups and downs in the world. And a lot of wisdom lies in simply that fact of being able to step back. Look at the situation in terms of a larger framework. So that your thoughts aren't focused so intensely on what you don't like, or focused so intensely on the person that you don't like, or the activity that you don't like. Because so they're so focused like that, there are huge blind spots around them to make us lose our perspective, not only about what's happening, but also what we should be doing. Because oftentimes what gets shunted off to the side when there's anger is the sense of shame and sense of fear of the consequences of our actions. People can get extremely courageous in dumb ways when they're angry, because their fear of the consequences of action just gets shoved off to the side like a poor relative. So the first step is to take that larger viewpoint, see it in a larger framework. And within that framework, your anger becomes something obviously that you don't want to follow follow through with. You don't want it to influence your actions, because you know you're going to, if you're going to fall heir to your actions, you don't want them to be done with an unskillful state of mind. So that's what equanimity does. It reminds you of that fact. That's when you can drop your focus on the object of anger and look at the anger itself in the mind. The problem is complicated by the fact that there's also usually a physical reaction. When anger bursts into the mind, it really sets your bloodstream churning. All these hormones start coming out in your bloodstream. Your heart beats in a different way. You breathe in a different way. There's a sense of tension and discomfort in the body. And our immediate reaction is we'd like to get that out of our system. If we try to get it out of our system in the usual way, which is speaking under the force of the anger, that just compounds the problem. And also it creates a lot of confusion, thinking that sometimes we can actually think ourselves into a better perspective about our anger, but the churning in the bloodstream is still going on, which makes us think, well, we must still be angry. That churning in the bloodstream sometimes lasts for a long period of time. After all, you know, our bodies are built for that fight-or-flight syndrome reaction, which takes more than just a few seconds if you're going to fight, more than just a few seconds if you're going to run away. But when you're trying to overcome the anger in your mind, it's not that the lastingness of those hormones in our bloodstream is not all that helpful. So make sure that you realize they are two separate things. The mind itself may have calmed down from the anger, but the physical manifestations are still there. And so you want to deal with them. Just breathe through the tension. Breathe in such a way that gets your heart beat back to normal. Breathe in such a way that gets the feeling of tension in your body back to normal. You might want to think of the tension in your body just flowing out your feet, flowing out your hands. Open up those energy channels so you're not carrying this stuff around. That makes it a lot easier to deal with because you feel less burdened or less irritated or less constricted physically. 
And then you can look at the mind in and of itself. What is this state of anger? As I said, it's often a blinding of the mind. You're putting blinkers on the side of your eyes. You're metalized, so you can only see certain things. You focus on certain details. And that state of being constricted mentally like this is really unpleasant. And just simply the fact of looking at it helps take off some of those blinkers. You don't have to be afraid of it. Just say, well, what is this state here? What is it like to be angry? Here's an example. And taking a look at it begins to open things up again. But again, it has to come from that position of that larger perspective. that helps you see through the anger, helps you disidentify with the anger. It may still be there in the mind, but you don't have to identify with it. You see it as a separate mental event. And that's important, because you realize there are parts of the mind that really aren't angry, that are not involved with the anger at all. The anger seemed to consume the mind, but that was simply because it narrowed your perception of what your mind, what was going on in the mind. So as you open things up like this, then you can help weaken the anger, weaken the hold of the anger on your mind. When you get this larger perspective, then you can step back and look at the situation and say, well, what really should be done? What really should be said here? What are my opportunities? What are the choices available to me? And if you have a broader broader viewpoint here, then it's easier to see the, the choices that you just couldn't have seen when you had the blinkers on. And you can see what, what really would be appropriate. What if you say that thing that you feel so much like saying? What would be the results of that? If you see that the results wouldn't be good, then you remind yourself, I don't want that. Maybe not right now might not be the best, place to, best time to speak anything at all. Maybe I should wait for another, circum another set of circumstances. And because you've breathed through the physical side of the anger, it makes it a lot easier to delay your actions to a more appropriate time. Or if it so happens that something should be done right away, the fact that you've broadened your perspective helps you see better things to do, better things to say right away. So remember this as an appropriate antidote to a normal way of re reacting to anger. Because so often when we're angry, we're either angry at the person we're angry at, or we turn around and get angry at ourselves for the anger, which neither of which really is very helpful. We step back and look at the situation, it helps see the actions of that other person in context. After all, this is the way the world is. When we talk about the limitations of the world, sometimes it seems very confining and very depressing, but it's actually a liberating teaching. There's no way you're going to make the world perfect. So you don't have to make the world perfect. That takes a huge burden off the mind right there. Then you simply think of what should be done right now given the perspective you have, looking at the world as a whole, looking at the way human nature is, looking at the human enterprise here, and the fact that it's you see your interaction with that other person or with that other group of people within the context of a much larger enterprise, the ways of the world. Of course it's going to be imperfect. What did you expect? Given the fact that the world is imperfect, what are you going to do right now? To react in the most skillful way, to respond in the most skillful way. In this way you find that the lessons from the meditation, this quest for skillfulness, it's precisely this lesson that translates best into daily life. As you deal with anger, as you deal with lust, as you deal with fear, as you deal with all the imperfect situations in the world. 
seeing that they're imperfect, and then yet trying to find a skillful response. This quest for skillfulness requires that you use your imagination. That's what that larger perspective is for. It opens up more possibilities to your imagination. So that your old habits don't form ruts that you can never get out of. You think of different ways of responding, different unexpected ways of responding. And that's where really insight really opens up new possibilities in your life, and this is where it shows its true worth. The ability to see the mind minutely is an important insight, only if it really influences the way you act and speak and think to make it more skillful. So keep that perspective in mind. Keep that quest in mind as well, the quest for skillfulness, so that your actions really do fall into the path to the end of suffering and don't keep falling back into that old pattern that leads to more and more suffering again and again and again. This is where the meditation shows its true value in our lives, even if we don't get all the way to the ultimate skill of the death, of reaching the deathless. Still, the fact that we've trained ourselves to be more and more skillful leads us in that direction, inclines the mind in that direction. If we don't make it in this lifetime, well, the next time around we'll be heading in that direction. It becomes a momentum that we build up. So do your best to keep the mind heading in that direction, because otherwise samsara, this wandering around that we do, is pretty aimless. The images the Buddha gives is throwing a stick up in the air. Sometimes it falls on its end, sometimes it falls on the other end, sometimes it falls flat. Pretty random, pretty aimless. Try to turn your life less into a stick thrown up into in the air, into an arrow, heading in a particular direction, towards a direction of more and more skillfulness. Because ultimately, someday, whether it's in this lifetime or the next, that arrow will reach its target. But only if you focus on this issue of skillfulness right here, right now, and keep it right here, right now, every right here and right now. That's what builds up the momentum. That's what gives your life direction. <clears throat> 